morning I headed to the Willie Mullins yard for the media open day class Sutton. The operation there is just absolutely incredible to see, as well as seeing some of the best stars in action. We got a great insight into how the operation is run, as some of Willie's views on some of Irish Irish racing's biggest issues, and we got a little chat with Willie at the end. So hope you enjoy the video. Yeah, I, I, I imagine we're probably going to try for the King George. That's going to be his early season name, and then. We'll see how that goes, and then I, I, I'm thinking I, I like my preference to be for the right now, but I haven't spoken to Shieldy Park yet. They have a blue tart in the Gold Cup. They want to split their options. Uh, he's a couple of options to start off. I think the Clonmel Oil. Are you favouring that? Um, a, a lot will depend on the ground, whether, whether the ground comes right at the time. Uh, then there's the, the Durkin, as he did last year. It might be too near Christmas this year. And uh, we have one other option, I think. Uh, th there's a race in England as well. Um, is it the Charlie Hall chase, which is a sort of a bit uh, something we don't normally do, but we'll see. Uh, at the moment, he's in good form, and um, I hope to have him ready for action by the time the Clamel oil comes around. Uh, six, Gallop and Deschamps. Gallop and Deschamps. A couple of options again. Yeah. Um, He's a lot easier. I mean, you know, I hope he's our Gold Cup horse for the year. And he looks the part, he's doing everything right at home. Uh, had one little setback there a few days, well, a couple of weeks ago, but he's back doing everything right again. But that, that's just horses, they, they all have little setbacks. And um, see, Durkin being, I'd like to start him off there, but it's the 11th of December this year, which is quite near Christmas. We went. You know, I'm, I'm always worried about the ground at Leperstown, but I'm he, he's run around Leperstown twice, I think, and been fine. Uh, but it's you know, he's a big, big horse, he doesn't look at it, and that, that's what I like about him. I love horses that are big tall that they don't look at because it means they're so well proportioned and um, he's light on his feet. Uh, so, so it might not be until Christmas. We didn't go there last year. Oh, we didn't go on to Christmas last year, I think, did we? Or did, no, he went to the dark end, sorry. Um, I'd like to get a run into him early December and then go to, to Christmas or to more. So we'll see what way it happens New Year's Day. Okay. Five uh, this morning is Blue Lord. <coughs> Blue Lord, uh, champion chase type. Uh, we'll go down the... Um, uh, what have we got? There's three two mile chases. There's the Hilly Way, the Poplar Square, and the Fort Tree. Yeah. So I imagine he'll go in one of those. So he will. And that'll be the route go to Leopardstown at Christmas and then hopefully Dublin Racing Festival and on to Cheltenham then. There's no forcing you into telling us to which, which it'll be. You'd, um, uh, just to start him off, just to end going. Yeah, I think it'll be one of the first two races, either the Fort Tree or the Poplar Square. Okay. Number 15, Statler, another of your Cheltenham festivals. Yeah, Statler won the National Hunt Chase. Uh, he wouldn't immediately spring to mind to you as a, a Gold Cup horse, but I'm probably going to try and aim, have that aim. He'd be a good second string for Ronnie Bartlett with Galvin. We know he goes around the track. We know he is able to jump. We know he's able to stay. Um, you know, a lot of water to go under the bridge between now and March. So we will be keeping him... We'll be aiming along that Gold Cup route. Where he ends up, I, who knows? You know, he could be Grand National horse. For 16, you mentioned him already, Energamin. Energamin, I, I think the Hilly Way is our preferred option at this point in time, all being well. So uh, that's where we'll start. And he'll go down the two mile route, I think. And uh, whether we go to Ascot this year or not, I don't know. But a lot of people got a lot of fun out of it last year. So we'll, you know, we'll have a, a look at that. Number 21 this morning, Tornado Flyer. He starts in the John Durkin. He did. Um, whether I get him out in a shorter race, as, as I said, the John Durkin is just too close to Christmas, but I imagine he'll go for the King George again and then on to Cheltenham. Okay, number 23, uh, Ellie May. Ellie May, uh, Mayor's Chase. Um, we went to Carlisle, I think, last year, didn't we, for Aintree? For the start. Uh, her, her first, or was her first one last year, the year before, when there was a race in Carlisle. But there's one. What was it last year? Was it? 
Oh, well, that's what happened, yeah. I thought, sorry. Right, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, but I think there's a mare's chase here as well. We, we'll just start her wherever we can. She's in good form. She came back. She did very well in the summer, but, but she always does. She's always quite heavy, so hopefully I can get her out before Christmas. Capadano, um, I think he's a grade one horse. I think he's good enough to go for the Gold Cup. Um, where did we? St I have him entered in the Coral Gold Cup at Newbury. Speculative, probably. I'd, we'll see what weight he gets, but he'll be down that staying novice. So sorry, staying grade one chase route. And it's 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 going to be a tougher race in the Morgiana, but I think I, I just I think maybe I might just start him there. Uh, maybe we'll find out early where he's going. You know, it, it's in against the older horses. It's a step up for him, and it's always tough for the horses to come out of the novice season <coughs> to to start off in a race like that. But. You know, if we think he's going to be a champion hot horse, maybe that's where we should start off. In number 19, Stateman. Over hurdles, staying over hurdles. Or... The Stateman, we sort of thought he was going to be a nice novice chaser. Chatting to Paul and Ruby, David Casey, Patrick, we're in two, either one of those horses were in two minds. Of, you know, he's, is he third favourite or fourth favourite for the champion hurdle? Uh, certainly easier to keep him sound for that and that family improved with age, so he's one that we, we have to have a chat with, uh, with our connections as well about. I, I thought, I had the, you know, I'd him and Sir Gerhard penciled in as novice chasers at the start of the season. As we get near our kickoff point, I'm beginning to question, you know, whether we should have a look at the champion hurdle with these horses, and I think he's, he has the quality to be a champion hurdle horse, whether he's good enough to win it or not, but he, he certainly could line up in one the way he won in Cheltenham. And I think he's a horse we haven't seen the very best of at all yet. Number 10 is Echoes in Rain, a big winner for Patrick at the Galway Festival. That's right, she was disappointing in Cheltenham last year. And I think I just too much gear on her. Uh, we'll probably just let her race with an ordinary an ordinary bridle this year. Uh, she was a big disappointment for us at the Mayor's Hurdle. I'm, I'm going to aim her back at the Mayor's Hurdle with sort of different tactics and different tack. Last but not least, a uh, favour of Patrick Shirley, Sharjah. Sharjah, yeah. Main aim, I suppose, the whole season will be Leprechaun at Christmas. And um, he'll go for the Morgiana. Uh, he was back a little bit later than the others. Uh, but you know, we, we, I'm going to step up his training now, try and get him, try and get him ready for the Morgiana and then on to Christmas and hopefully he might get a spin in champion hurdle as well. I can go chasing with her, I'm happy enough to stay hurdling. Her form last year, winning in Fairyhead, beating, is it Harry Fry's now? Yeah. Yeah, gives her, you know, put, must put her in her sort of a favourite chance, I think, for the Mayor's Hurdle. Oh, do you happy enough to go right-handed again or with a big stick in left? Or? Uh, left is a lot easier for her. Um, won't be looking for right-handed races, but sometimes you just can't help it. You've got to go right-handed uh, if the right race is there. You know, so we would rather stay left. Uh, yeah, she seems to be very keen to just stay on the left-handed track. Gerhard, I have a few horses like Sir Gerhard that I'm not sure where I'm going with. I've got to have a good chat with the owners. When he won his maiden hurdle, I thought he shaped like a champion hurdle horse. He's won a point to point, so he can go novice chasing. Uh, I was a little disappointed with a couple of his runs over hurdles where he missed out hurdles. And at the start of the season, I thought I was going to go novice chasing with him, but the more I look at the hurdle picture. I'm 
I'm tempted to stay overheard with them, but once again I got to chat to Mrs. Thompson and Richard and Chris Richards and the, the whole Shevely Park team and see what their views are. Um, we have a few, you know, there's the pros and cons and, and my team at home here are split on the uh, the split on it as well, you know, some say we'll go novice chasing. We can always go novice chasing and come back over hurdles, but I definitely haven't ru ruled them out of a, of the champion hurdle bid. Um, but we will see. That's a that few horses like that, unfortunately, for you guys this morning. <laughs> but anyhow, it was... Okay. Uh, number two is appreciated. Uh, you only got him out once last season. That's all. He had a small problem. We decided not to go for the rest of the season because... When you have a novice, you want to get a full season. You don't want to go for a half season, especially for a good novice. So he'd go novice chasing. we start him off whenever the ground comes right and when he's coming right. Uh, you know, I imagine with the sort of speed he showed over hurdles, we would uh, have no problem going down the Arctic route. Um, you know, so he, I, I don't, it doesn't really matter to me whether he starts off at two or two and a half. We just wait for him and for the right race to come along. But I imagine he, he'd be aiming towards the arc. It wouldn't surprise me if he ended up as a, uh, what was he called? Uh, is it a John Turner race? Uh, two, hmm? Yeah, wouldn't surprise me if he went out to two and a half miles. And I've no doubt he'd have no problem with three miles, but he's, he's very sharp at the shorter trip. And if he can jump fences the way he jumps hurdles, uh, you know, he, he I could see him being an arc horse. Number 18, Dysart Dynamo. All wasn't well at Manchester. Yeah, he had a very hard race in Cheltenham. Uh, Dysart Dynamo looks the type that should be a, a really good novice chaser. His style of jumping, his style of racing, you would look at him being a top two mile novice chaser. And once again, uh, he's a big horse, so we will wait until the ground is really right for him. Um, yeah, we, we were, I think we were all set to go novice chasing with him last year. Then he had a small setback and we said, right, let's just go down the stairs hurdle route. Uh, but he's one that I haven't fully made up my mind about yet. I might give him another pop over fences and see how that goes and then think about it. But he'd be, I imagine he'd want to be a staying novice chaser. Number two, Flame Bear, a new recruit. Flame Bear is a nice new recruit from Pat Doyle's. He was very good over hurdles. At the second half of last season, he's a fine, big chasing type. Has plenty of stamina to win over the longer trips. I imagine with his style of racing, we we'll probably I'd be aiming him towards the shorter trips and see how things go. He's very forward going, and Jack Doyle was riding him last year, and he always uh, sort of kept him. Uh, in pockets too, uh, and you can I can see now why because the horse is very forward at home. He he wants to get on with his job, and it it was the best way to settle him. Uh, so you know he he was difficult. He can be difficult enough to ride, but I think fences will settle him down. Uh, he's a novice, um, so he will be a staying novice for the season. I think um, very happy with him doing everything right. And um, uh, he, he just got out of another staying out of the route. I suppose we an obvious candidate for the national chase, would he? I imagine Patrick will probably be trying to get him onto that um, that roster, all right. Uh, he, he would look that. I mean, if he makes um, what's the RSA now? Anyone got the Brown uh, Advisory? Brown Advisory, Patrick's sponsor. So. Um, yeah, he, he, he will be in that in that bracket anyhow. Uh, number three this morning is Facile, Facile Vega. Facile Vega has to be one of the, you know, over the years, the last few years, I haven't seen a horse that I want to, uh, that I'm looking forward to as much as Facile Vega all the time trying to keep him sound he's been very sound and very good and he go novice hurdling he you know turn a foot he showed in bumpers he'd be a supreme novice horse 
with his pedigree, he can go out to be a Ballymore horse. Um, my my whole aim this year is to try and not to train him out. David Porter rides him out, and I keep telling David, don't let me work him too hard. Uh, you know, I think he he doesn't need to be worked very hard. I think we just get all this conditioning work into him. I think he'd be fine. And we'll get him away over hurdles as soon as we get nice ground. And he's jumping at this time? He's very good. He's like his mother. He's a natural. So uh, I, I don't have much, don't have any problem with his jumping. I don't know why he wasn't on my list this morning. <laughs> Someone left him off. Maybe we had enough number class to go around. But um, he's he's in good shape and he looks, uh, he looks like a real, uh, you know, he's going to be a top notch novice this season, I think. So we just ran him in a few of those big races last year, and if he won, he well and good. But the uh, fact that he didn't means he's he's going to be an exciting novice for the season. Trip wise, very proud. Looking at him, you'd say he'd go two and a half easily, but I think he has enough. I think he's sharp enough to go two. Looking at the size of him this year, he's grown and matured. I'd want a nice dig in the ground before I'd run him. I think. She's good. Uh, I've been really delighted with her work. I started working her lately, um, a bit ahead of the others, and she's really pleasing me. I, I'd say we could see she'd be one of the first horses out, I'd say, this season. Here's now the truth. Yeah, yeah, hopefully she jumps well. Uh, but she's doing everything right at home now. Dark Raven won the House of Bumper and missed the season last year. Uh, he's back over hurdles this season. He will be nice, nice type. Okay, a lovely French horse that we got. Real hurdler uh, in the making, I think. So uh, he's a compact type. Um, not, a, not, not one that we'll be going chasing with, I think, down the road. Um, once again, he'll be around Christmas after that, maybe. Daddy Longlegs, uh, it's a nice acquisition for France. Jumps very well. Uh, I might give him a few runs towards the end of the season. Um, no, don't think I want him out too early. And uh, he's on a little break now, so you so, um, you know, if he comes in around Christmas time or after that, that'll be fine. But he's one he's taken naturally to hurdles so looking forward to him when he gets out Zanuck the Brave is another one that's schooling well at the moment uh, probably go out around Christmas time all being well like three year old How has a lot of joy come out of Sarah so that which, is she schooling well? A lot of joy is great and she jumps she schooled very well the other day Paul was very happy with her and she is, we had her pinpointed for Galway this weekend. And the race was a five-year-old and upward race rather than a four-year-old and upward race. So that plan is gone, but she's ready to run. Um, she's more like a flat filly than a jumps filly. So I think her seat, I'm going to be very, I, I, I think I'll, I'll race her complainer lightly rather than hardly. Uh, if she shows enough skill at her jumping in her first run, I'll just try and handpick her races with a view to trying to end up in the mayor's novice either in Cheltenham or Fairy House. Fairy House being a grade one race should be our main target. And that's over two and a half miles being a Swedish ledger winner. That shouldn't be any trouble to her. And also I mean the way she ran in as a Zarvich. Um, you know, she gave herself a very hard race that day from an outside draw. And um, she looks she looks an exciting prospect. I mean, Paul and I came out and Frank the form. Uh, I, I imagine we'll go novice hurling with him. I imagine he'll be staying novice hurdler. So we'll be very looking forward to him. Uh, so we are, it's, yeah, it's Jimmy's time. Yeah. So, Nice point of pointer, Chapeau de Salil. Uh, I imagine he's going to be, he could work into a top class bumper horse. I've got a full sister to Alaho called Shaving. 
she's a lovely type. Uh, I think she um, she's going to be a fair mare going down the mare's route in bumpers. But she I got think the same sort of physique. As she has this, yeah. She's just like a a younger sister rather than a smaller sister. You know, she's because I had another sister and she was small enough. Uh, but this filly is a she's a lovely big filly. Plenty of size and scope about her. Uh, protecting. I think he's very close related to the good horse, uh, Harry's Fountain's horse. Could be a half brother. Uh, he looks a real nice bumper type uh, for the season. Well, I hope we see an upswing, but then. A, a lot of the early season races, you know, particularly Pontchartown, the, the Morgiana meeting, John Jorkin, they don't seem to gather people together for some reason. Um, you know, it, it's nearly Christmas before you get lots of people at race meetings. And I thought COVID's just the challenge of COVID and getting people back into the habit of racing. And um, you know, I, the, the one thing I don't like about racing at the moment is the 35 minute gap between races. It's bad enough in jump racing, but in flat racing, you know, you can only go for so many cups of tea or drinks or whatever between races, and it makes the day very long and unappealing, I think, to customers. And I think, I think racing needs to sharpen itself up and have a bit of a buzz going. You know, I find now when I'm going racing, if I were running the first and the last, um, I'd probably just go to the last, I mean, hanging around all day, you know, and it's the same, I think, for customers. You know, the regular race goer, it's different for festival race goers who are going for the day out and they're, they probably only go to a festival or maybe go to their Christmas meeting or St. Patrick's Day meeting or something. But for regular race goers, they want to go and be entertained and they want racing every at least 30 minutes. Um, I think that extra five minutes just, I don't think it's good for racing. So um, I'd be an advocate of sort of tightening it up. I know that brings us on to who runs the show and the, which brings us on to, is that Jonathan Mullen coughing there or not? I think he's coming. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, I, I see we've got the, I, Racing TV, you've got the option or got the media rights. I, I don't think the deal is actually, it hasn't been fully sanctioned no. yet. You know, there's a lot of negotiating to go between that, but that's to me one key thing about getting people back in the gate into racing. Quicker action, more action, and um, uh, and I think race courses need to to see that. Uh, you know, it's it, it it can be very long, and things are long; they get too boring. So you just want to tighten it up. That be my message, anyhow, you know, too. Or my wish, whether well, it's a message or not, but a wish, but um, for racing, just to uh, tighten things up and make it more entertaining for the for the regular race car. At the races, had a great show showing live TV. You didn't have to pay for racing TV. Is not like that, but I wonder how much of of that is important. Is there? the income streams come from a lot of other areas and from what I can gather the actual percentage of people watching racing on their own TV at home is very a very small part of the whole package and I think that's what I, I don't understand that but that's the way it's been explained to me um, getting racing on terrestrial TV and getting people watching on their phones is far more important and that seems to be the way that that's why the money is is um, more important, I think, than the actual actual having free to wear TV. So I'm just I'll have to believe what I'm told, and um, hope that it's a better package for people in the industry and for in general. You know. I know you're you're saying it's a smaller part to say the overall breakdown. But who there would you have preferred to see it on a Sky Sports Race type platform or? You got you mentioned the accessibility there. Uh, I think both both Racing TV and Sky Sports have excellent products. Um, you, uh, they have excellent products, and both have their pluses and minuses. And at the end of the day, the people who run racing for us and who do an excellent job in Irish racing 
um, HRI have gone down the route they're going and, you know, I have to trust them. I think we have to trust them, people in the industry. But, you know, I admire the way he, he just called it straight and the way he worked his players. Um, I've never had a training session, but listening to people who were, you know, that you just had to go and stand up and be counted. And, um, you know, coming down to their trials and, you know, and he just called it and wasn't afraid to call it when he had to drop a big name or anything. If he saw something wasn't right, he just went with his gut feeling, which I thought was huge. You know, we'll probably, we'll never see the likes of him again, I think. But I don't know if Hurling will ever see the likes of him again, you know. So having a legend so close is, um, you know, fantastic. And, and just to be there to watch what he was doing over the years. Uh, but albeit from, uh, from a television point of view and, and once or twice in Crow Park, but that's all I ever saw. But um, you know, I, I did admire what he was doing. Did you win for the carns? Any carns? Get him on the deep sand. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt it. I doubt it. No. Um, I wish them the best of luck for the season. So for the year. The time that takes me anywhere up to a week or ten days to ring an owner with a disappointment because. I know it's probably his only horse for the season. And that's um, that's another thing too, you know, when, I mean, I'm lucky enough if I have a, a horse that is out for the season and I feel bad for five minutes and then I think, Jesus, if that was a smaller trainer down the road, you know, that's his sort of um, champion hurdler. And that's probably the only grade one horse he has in the yard. And I, and, uh, I think, and I, I always feel for a smaller trainer when their good horse is gone, you know, I'm, we're lucky. We have fortunate enough to have lots of nice horses, but, um, I think a lot of people don't, don't see that, that, you know, that's his whole reason for getting up in the morning. Maybe he's one horse. And, um, so when their horses go down, I, I, I feel the, I feel the, the pain a bit too, because I know what it means. You know, I remember when I, we were smaller and we had one or two good horses and they were out for the season. And that is, that's a real killer. Everyone has their their spake and all and all the, the head men in the yard, they um I mean I got a, a bollocking from my head guard last night <laughs> at the party because <laughs> I dropped her in it with um an owner here yesterday. Uh she told me something I'd forgotten about it. So um and then I came out of course and wondered where this particular horse was and uh, she fielded the question nicely, but then she very gave it to me last night. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. You know, it's just an amalgam of just tremendous people out there. And I love to give them uh, the responsibility. As, as I said about Facile Vega with David Porter, you know, I'd be there in the morning and you saw the way we're just going along with sort of 50, 60 horse on a lot. And, and it's we're doing our best. And then David might say to me, no, you said not to work him hard and I'd say, okay, just do a half speed. And so Rachel, you know, she has Ellie May there. Uh, she has her own little quirks. And then Imran with Hadir, he goes off and does his own thing as you saw this morning. They all do their own thing and I let them get on with it. And, and when I, I think you just give people that responsibility, they take it and run with it and it's one less worry for me. I don't have to micromanage everything. So I let them do the job. And when there's a problem, they come back to me. Or if I get it wrong, which is what, you know, they something that's against the grain of what our general line is going to be for the year, they tell me. And that's so I, I think that's how I do it, rather than me being able to remember everything. I don't try. I don't. I just have a few lists here that Gronia does out for me. And I'd like to keep things a general focus on where we're going for the season and what happens where our starting point is not really important. Our, our midpoint, probably a little more important, but the end point is the important thing. And that's why, you know, I mean, I know everyone wants to come here today and want to see where the starting points are, but uh, I prefer 
only think about that when the horse is right and when the ground when the conditions are right. Yeah. And so that that I'm not all the time sitting there in the desk thinking we have to have him ready for Flan we have to have him ready for the Turk and the Morgiana, Hatton's Grace. I tend to just let it happen if it happens. It's in the back of my mind, but it, it doesn't have to work out that way. That couch, that dog, <laughs> <laughs> and maybe TV, but um, yeah, like, you know, I, when I come in, when I come in to the house, I switch off completely from horses. I, you leave your phone inside or anything like that? No, no, that's yeah. constant. That's, yeah. I'm, I'm either sick or lost the phone if it's not with me. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you can always switch off the phone, which I do at times, but... Um, do you then? No. <laughs> <laughs> at bedtime, yeah, at bedtime. Um, you work very well, I think, the other day. Shy. <laughs> Ah, he smells money. You don't want to take it out of my pocket <laughs> in the evening watching television. So, Willie, thanks very much for having us all down here today. I'd say it's a big operation getting this together to show the media all your horses this morning. It is, but thankfully I've got wonderful staff, uh, David Casey, Patrick, um, Groin in the office. They pull the whole thing together for me, hand me a bit of paper and send me out to meet you guys. And the strength and depth shown here this morning is just incredible. I think he's probably as strong as you've ever been going into this part of the season. It must be very exciting. It is. I mean, we, I pinch myself every morning. I go to the gallop and every evening when I'm going through the, the stables, you know, the, the types of horses we have here, the stuff absolutely beautiful horses. I think... My job now is just to try and keep them sound. Uh, it's it's easy and it's lovely up to this time of the year, but from now on I'm going to have to start training them harder and then you get disappointments and uh, that can be hard to take. Obviously, when you started here first, you were no stranger to good horses, but did you ever envision it getting to this level? Never. If, um, I mean, it's just unbelievable. Uh, you know, the amount of the amount of the quality of the horses, the owners, everything that's here, the, the quality of the staff, the quality of the jockeys that we have. It's you know, when when we were growing up, if a trainer had fifty or sixty horses, that was fantastic. And if, if you said to me the first day I got my license, you'd have fifty horses for the rest of your life riding out, I'd I'd have taken that. And like we've sort of four times that amount here at the moment and it's just incredible. But but we appreciate it. We as I said, we pinch ourselves every day looking at them. And along with all the stars that we all know, you have established a very strong team of younger horses this year as well. Just when you're sourcing the younger horses, is there certain characteristics you look for? Well, we we probably try and buy horses with form. So you're looking at a horse with form, then you see a horse in a race and you think, right, or, or in a point to point, then want to buy him. So then you've got to go in and get him bettered, look at the horse, look at the pedigree, and you know, it's a, it's a cutting down process from the time you see the horse with a little bit of form. And depending on whether a horse is placed in a race and you think he could improve, he could mature next year into a nice horse, you've got to look at that picture. If a horse comes out and flashes it very good the first day, he's going to cost a bomb. You've got to try and find a client that might want to pay for that sort of horse. We don't buy as many stores as we used to. Um, stores are cheaper, but, but they're still quite expensive. Uh, but you don't know what you're getting. Uh, in a store, you know, you they've, they've never had a bridle on, they've never had a saddle on. So paying a bit more if you're lucky enough to have a client for a horse with form is uh, an easier route to getting a bit more success anyhow, I think. And one thing you'd always notice about your runners in the track is their willingness and their eagerness to run. They really want to run for you most of them when they get onto the race course. Is that something that maybe is a characteristic you look for when buying them or is it something that you think you can ingrain into a young horse through different training techniques? Well, you, you certainly look for it when you're buying one. You look for a brave horse. Um, but you hope with the type of training you do that you can get them to, uh, you know, to have that characteristic. Other times then, when you do that, put that into them, it, it can be over keen and that can be detrimental to their form as well. So it's a fine line trying to get them to settle in a race uh, rather than running too keen early in a race, you know, which can happen a lot of horses. 
and then you have to try and make a front runner out of them or, or drop them in behind and, and cover them up or maybe change the distance that they run over, you know. And just one thing that I noticed when looking at the gallops, the, your wood chip is a lot deeper than you see in many yards. Is that something you think that helps the horses become tougher uh, in their training? Well, I think this morning we've had about two inches of rain, I think, in the last five days. So it's very, very tough this morning. Um, it, it's not usually as deep as that. Um, you know, but uh, we, we like to keep it safe. Like chatting to... Uh, flat trainers, you know, they, they get all their problems below the knees. They get sore shins, they get joints, they get past and foot problems. We very seldom get that. Our, our problems are above the knees. You know, we, we probably get more muscle problems than from keeping the ground a little bit softer. But it keeps them sounder and I think it keeps them sounder anyhow. And it's um, because our gallops are flat, we need to get more work into the horses too. Otherwise, they'd be going around there all day if the ground is too good, like a lot of flat trainers would have. And is there any young horse in particular you think we should be keeping an eye out on? I think Rich Ritchie has a, I've been loving a lovely horse, Rich Ritchie, called Key de Paris. And uh, he'll come out in the bumper, hopefully around Christmas time. Um, he's one I think that people should keep an eye on. Champion I hope horse. I haven't put the knockers on him now. <laughs> That's normally what happens. <laughs> well, you've, heard, we've heard a few plans for your more established stars. Just when you're making these early season plans, does it ever come into consideration who they might be coming up against or is it that come into the picture at all? Not really. I try... I train them just to get them ready for the track and then when they're ready for the track we look around and see what race is available uh, rather than training them to aim for a certain race. My objective is probably aiming them for the spring when the ground is nice, when all the big races are run. And uh, I, I, you know, if you if you're shying away from people or from horses, it, it makes it more difficult. So sometimes you just take your chance, run against them, and, and then you know straight away where you fit into the picture. Very good. And this final question: You know, if, if you got a charity bet today to back one of your horses for Cheltenham, who would you be backing? I think uh, I'd have to go with Facile Vega. But don't ask me which race. <laughs> but <laughs> Brilliant, it's a supreme novice of the Ballymore. <laughs> thanks very much, Willie. <laughs> well done, Emma. Thanks very much.